Sabbath to you all. It's so good to be here worshiping with you again. Um, I just was looking over my sermon record and I discovered that it's been about a year and a half since I last uh, was here worshiping with you. And uh, I do want to apologize for delaying the service by putting Chris on the spot uh, and asking him to hook up my computer, but uh, we have a plan B and uh, and we don't need to be dependent upon the, the computer. Thank you, Chris, for working with me, with, for your flexibility. And um, my apologies again for the delayed start. The smell of potluck is holding me accountable to a timeline, though. Uh, it smells delicious. It is so good to be here with you all. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nate Hellman, and in spite of my last name, I am a Christian. I tend to have to say that. Uh, wherever I go, I believe in Jesus. I've been journeying with him since 2003 when I gave my heart and life to him. And I've been in ministry since 2008, pastoring uh, various churches uh, not too long ago, but maybe longer than I, than I think, uh, was here in Central Oregon in Madras and Prineville churches. Um, and then from there, I went on to Gladstone Park, and now I'm the Associate Ministerial Director in the Oregon Conference, which means I get to coach and support pastors. And we in the conference are so grateful for your pastor, Pastor John Tillet, uh, for accepting the call to come here to cent Central Oregon and for his uh, intentional ministry. We're just so grateful for him. I wanted to share with you a picture of my family. Uh, this is the, these are the six of us and they are now uh, worshiping at Gladstone Park today. They're involved uh, in, in ministry, very active in ministry in our church, uh, doing music ministry today. It's kids' praise time, and Emily, my wife, coordinates that. Um, but my kids are getting older, and that means I'm getting older too. Uh, my oldest will be 14, and my youngest is uh, about to turn six already. So I've been on a, a bit of a journey in life. Uh, yes, the family proves that. Uh, ministry proves that. Um, but I do want to say, and I believe I said this here before, that wherever God calls me in ministry and in life, I never want to stop being a disciple and teacher of Jesus. I never want to stop being a disciple and teacher of Jesus. And I hope that that is something that, that you embrace as well. Because no matter what our role may be in the church or in life, we are all called to be disciples of Jesus, and we're all called to make him known. I just, I love how God works. And this morning as we were talking about discipleship and mission, um, bells were ringing in my mind as I thought about uh, what we're going to go over this morning in, in our message. But before we launch into that, would you bow your heads with me once more and let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, you are so faithful and so good to us. And Lord, we know in this time that we're living in, in the busyness of our worlds and, and in all that's going on um, in our nation, we know that there are many, many competing agendas. But Lord, we know that Jesus has an agenda. And we want to be in alignment, Lord, with, with your agenda. So Lord, I pray for your spirit to touch our hearts today, to lead us closer and closer to Jesus, to get us onto your agenda so that we can be your ambassadors and your disciples in this world. We love you and worship you and praise you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to imagine that you are busy at work doing that thing that you're spending so much time doing lately. Whether that's your job, whether that's caring for your children, whether that is your never-ending to-do list, maybe it's your hobby, your craft, whatever it may be, you're engaged, you're fully engaged. And you've done this thing so many times that you're kind of on autopilot, much like when you're driving a car, maybe. And as you are working at that thing, your mind begins to drift a little bit, and you're thinking, there's got to be more than just this. There's got to be more to life 
than, than just this. There's got to be a greater purpose. And as you're thinking on these things, you look up and you see him. And he looks into your eyes, almost as though he knows exactly what you're thinking about. And he says to you, follow me, and I will make you into a missionary. Follow me, and I will make you into a missionary. Centuries ago, Jesus approached some fishermen at the Sea of Galilee, and he made an invitation to them. He approached them and said to them this, Follow me, and I will make you into fishers of men. Now, I want to pause here and ask a question. What does Jesus want his disciples to be? According to this verse. Soul winners, missionaries, fishers of men, right? Now, whenever I raise that question, and rightly so, we jump to the very end here. That is what God wants us to be. But Jesus, notice Jesus doesn't say to his disciples, go find some people, convince them of the good news, good luck. He says, no, he says, follow me and I am going to do the job of making you, of changing you, of working in your life, of transforming you into a fisher of men, into a missionary. And friends, you probably know that we can get ourselves into trouble if we launch out into ministry and mission without having been with Jesus. We need to be very careful. Of course, Jesus at one point said to the Pharisees, you search all over the world for a proselyte and you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe unto us if we're pursuing mission without pursuing Jesus first. Jesus says, follow me and I am going to do the work. I am going to do the work of transforming your life transforming you into a fisher of men. And, and, and Jesus is saying to his disciples that I'm going to make you just like me. I'm going to make sure that your purpose aligns with my purpose, my agenda. And I want to submit to you, just based on this verse, that a disciple, we call ourselves disciples, we call ourselves followers of Jesus, Christians, Seventh-day Adventists, if we call ourselves a disciple, we need to think about this definition. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, ongoing, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. Discipleship is not static. I praise God whenever there's a baptism. We, we we're, we're, we're joyous on those occasions, and, and we're, we're praising God along with heaven. And yet, discipleship doesn't stop there. It's an ongoing journey with Jesus. In other words, discipleship is not just a download of information. It's about transformation. It's about being changed by Jesus allowing him to change us. Now, there is a specific aim that goes even beyond this. It's, it's kind of what's behind this and, and what happens to us as we're doing that, the aim of discipleship. We're going to get into that in a moment. But before we go any further on the subject of discipleship, I want to share with you a special blessing. A special blessing. Um, and I, I might be getting ahead of myself, actually, as I... Look at my notes here. A blessing that um, supposedly is from the Jews. I did get ahead of myself. Stick a pin in that, okay? Not too long ago, in my BC days, in my before children days, I, uh, well, not too long ago, I guess that was 14, 15 years ago, um, I got to go to Washington, D.C. with my wife, Emily. And uh, 
we went to go and visit my Uncle Bob and Aunt Nancy, who worked over there in that area. And I told my Uncle Bob, Bob, I want to see it all. I've never been to Washington, D.C. before. And I, I, I want to see as much as possible over the next couple of days. And he took his job seriously. It's good to uh, know your destination when you're traveling, but it's really good to have a tour guide who knows all about that area. So Bob took us from monument to monument to museum to museum, and we, we saw as much as possible. The Washington Monument, the Capitol Building, the Library of Congress, the Martin Luther King Monument, the World War II Monument, all the Smithsonian's. I have memories in all of those places and just soaking it all in. But what I remember the most, for some reason, and this is kind of weird, is Uncle Bob's bright white New Balance sneakers and his bright white calves leaving me over and over again, walking away from me because he was moving. We were eating his dust. He was keeping us on that mission of touring around D.C. Now, the blessing that supposedly comes from the Jews relates to that. And the blessing is this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Now think about it. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. The idea here is that we would be following so close to our teacher, to our master, that it would be apparent to everybody else and to ourselves that we will be walking with Jesus that an, so closely that an impact would be made upon us. And I don't know about you, but I want to follow Jesus today. I want to be near him today. And I hope you asked for him to come as your heart and life again today. God's ultimate hope is, yes, that we would be missionaries bringing the gospel to the world while representing Jesus. But he wants to start by doing a work in us. How many of you want God to do a work in your life today? Amen. Let us start there. The invitation to follow Jesus and be changed by him. But there is a particular aim to this discipleship. We see in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus says this. He says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be what? Like his teacher. A disciple, when he's fully trained, will be like his teacher. So the, the whole aim of discipleship is this, that we would be like Jesus we again can get ourselves into trouble if we launch out into ministry and mission without following Jesus and being changed by Jesus. But he wants us to be Christ-like. Want, he wants us to be like him. Now, when you start a new job, what do you need in order to do your job well? Let's say you, you're just beginning. What, what's necessary in order for you to do your job? Training, exactly. Training. Now, I remember years ago um, in my BC, BC days, before Christ days, uh, I went to the, I went to a paint production factory, a paint plant. And my job, I was hired to be a paint canner. And I would have been a fool if I walked in there and rolled up my sleeves and acted like I knew exactly what to do. Like I, like, I, like I had it all together. What happened is I was paired with someone. I was paired with Michael. And Michael showed me the ropes of canning paint. Now, we had these gigantic 1,500-gallon tanks where the raw material was mixed up. And he says, okay, it's going to come down. We need to put a strainer on that. We need to make sure that all the chunks are strained out, that it comes down into this tub it's about 30 gallons of paint in this tub, and then we need it to come out, and, and you're going to lift the lever, fill up the paint can to the right level, and then close it off, put a lid on it, and send it down the conveyor belt, and then the other one of us is going to stack it up and get it ready for shipping. Okay. Now, even then, even being told what to do, I 
probably would have made a disaster. But what Michael did, he says, watch me for a while. What I want you to do is stack up the paint for uh, shipping. So I was in an ongoing training process with Michael where I was letting him take the lead. I was letting him show me what to do. Now, how do we follow Jesus? We have to learn from him. We have to stay close to him. We have to, we have to be mindful of where our focus is. And ultimately, we have to allow him to lead us. My notes are a little jumbled up here. There we go. We have to allow him to lead us. Discipleship is something different than just knowing theology knowing doctrine, which is good, which is important. It's, it's the substance of what we bring when we are preaching and sharing what we know. Discipleship is more than showing up at various church-related events. Discipleship is about knowing and becoming like Jesus and letting him lead, letting him change us, letting him transform us. And what does he want to change us into? He wants us to be a people who are Christ-like. And he did this through relationship. He invited his disciples to follow him, and he was to be in the lead. This is the, the obvious thing. But the question is, is, is Jesus Christ in the lead of your life? Or are you trying to fit him into your agenda? We also get ourselves in trouble when we do our own agenda in Jesus' name. There's a difference between following Jesus and what he desires of us, being led by him, and putting Jesus' name on what we want to do. We must allow Jesus to lead us. And as he leads us, he wants to transform us. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. There, there, there's a lot to be said here, but we, if Jesus is leading us, then, then he's going to be changing our mind about things. And if his agenda is to make us into disciples who are being changed by him and impacting the world in a Christ-like way, he's going to be transforming our minds. He's going to be changing our minds. Because I don't know about you, my default mode is not very Christ-like. And this really comes out in Portland traffic. I don't know if you get traffic here. I know you do. But it's not, uh, it's not quite like Portland, and it tests me, my friends. Pray for me. Pray for me. We have to let Jesus change our minds. How did Jesus transform his disciples? Well, they saw him in ministry. They followed his lead. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. They saw Jesus' agenda, and they took his lead. They followed him, and they cooperated. Well, I mean, they weren't perfect, right? They cooperated with what he was doing. And even today, we're expected to learn from him. And his disciples were, were expected to be eager pupils who were soaking in everything they could about him so that they were on his agenda. He wanted his disciples to be motivated, though, by their love for him, to follow his pattern, to model their lives after him. And so what did they do? They were, they were students. They observed him. They asked him questions. They learned of him. And today, Jesus, of course, this is an obvious thing, but Jesus wants us to learn from him. We as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a distinct message to bring to the world. Amen? Part of that is making God's character known. And part of that is giving the warning about what is, going, what, what is to come. And I love the prayer this morning, the emphasis on Jesus being our king. Things are going to change in this world, and they are changing rapidly. And, not but, but and, we must know Jesus and what he's all about. It's important to know the prophecies. It's important to know the fundamentals inside and out. But to be changed by Jesus, we need to be, be 
on, a, on an ongoing basis, be, being refreshed about what he is all about. This means we need to learn his ethics in the Sermon on the Mount, the parables. We need to familiarize, familiarize ourselves with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We need to understand his commandments, not the, just the ten, but the greatest, and the second that's like it. And did you know that Jesus offers a whole bunch of commands, a whole bunch of imperatives, calls us to do? We need to look, as we study the Gospel, at his actions. What is he doing in different situations? What does it mean to be Christ-like? His ethics his teachings, it can go on and on and on. When we learn more of Jesus, I don't know about you, but when I look at Jesus, I realize how, fall, how far I fall short. And I realize my need of being transformed by him again and again and again. Because Lord, I'm not lining up with your heart, with your mind, with your agenda. Please help me get on board with who you are and what you're doing. Again, Jesus doesn't want us to be merely full of information, but to be transformed and put that information into action. In other words, the aim of discipleship is to be like Jesus, and to be like Jesus, we have to obey him. That's part of letting him lead. That's an obvious thing, too. Obeying Christ. Now, there's a book I read just about uh, the many questions that we ask ourselves about uh, that we ask ourselves as humans. It's called the seven primal questions. I don't want to emphasize that as much as what the author, Mike Foster, brings out. He talks about a concept called infobesity. And the concept is that we are so full of knowledge and information, we have all sorts of information at our disposal, but we don't necessarily put it into action. We don't necessarily live out the truth that we're convicted of. We're knowledgeable about it, but we don't necessarily live it out. Imaginary scenario. Imagine if you would, I walk into my children's room, one of their rooms, on Sunday morning. And I walk in and I see that it is a mess. Toys are everywhere. That probably never happens to you parents, right? Toys are everywhere. And what do I say? I say, kids, please clean your room. It's time to clean your room. I make that statement, and I close the door, and I walk away, and I go to my chores, and I'm working away at my chores, and then I come back into the room, and I open up the door, and lo and behold, it's exactly the same. Just like that. My kids notice this didn't, well, maybe it did happen, but not exactly like this. They notice a look on my face, and they say, Father, thank you for your words. Thank you for your words. We understand your commandment. We understand it. We memorized it. You said, according to Dad, chapter 3, verse 27, kids, please clean your room. We looked closely at the words. We studied them in the Greek by room, you mean a particular space that's inhabited. The pronoun that you used implies that it's the room that belongs to us. We looked at the verb. It, it definitely is a, it's an imperative. It's a command. Is it okay if our friends come over? We want to brainstorm what it would look like if we cleaned our room. Oh, Dad. We've also made this commandment a 29th fundamental of your household teachings. What would I say? What do you think I would say? Clean your room, right? I would likely raise my voice, but I would just, I would just want cooperation. Just co please, just cooperate with me, right? Kids, clean. I would use my, my firm dad voice, my loud voice. James, we know, says to be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. And, and, and that's the thing. We don't want to be deceived that, that Bible knowledge is, is the end all. No, don't, don't get me wrong. 
may we be students of the scriptures. May we be growing in the information and in the doctrine and the understanding of the Bible. But let's not get infobese. Let's put it into action. John says that whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. In other words, if we say we believe in Jesus, that we are Christians, that we are Seventh-day Adventists, we are going to walk like Jesus. We are going to be Christ-like. We are going to be on his agenda and doing the very things that he invites us, that he calls us to do. So I want to ask you, do you know what Jesus teaches? And what steps are you taking to learn that, to apply that? Maybe there's a next step in your walk that God is calling you to. That you, haven't right, you haven't quite made, you haven't quite done. Whatever it is that God is, is showing you lately, whatever it is that he's convicting you of, or whatever it is that he is teaching you in Scripture, don't just leave it there. Ask yourself, what is my next step in light of this? And Lord, help me to make that step. Make me willing to do your will. So the aim of discipleship is to be like Jesus, but sometimes Jesus corrects us. Have you ever been corrected by the Lord? Have you ever, whether it's through the Holy Spirit or through reading the Scriptures, been corrected, been rebuked? Have something fly in your face and realize, wow, I'm, I've been off base here. Sometimes Jesus corrected his disciples. Oftentimes he did. We see a lot of moments like that. But there is one time I want to highlight right now that, that was almost comedic. And it's interesting because, because just this morning we were talking about the Samaritan woman, um, and this relates to Samaria. This is a little while later. They're walking through Samaria, and Samaria were the people, according to the Jews, who were not right. They were, they were off base. They had their own style of worship, their own temple. Um, they, they were not in harmony with, with God's ways. They're walking through Samaria, and they notice that the Samaritans are rejecting Jesus. They're not receiving him. And we all have people in our lives that, that we want to receive Jesus, that we hope that they do. And we all have people in our lives that may even be out, outright enemies of God, that we would want them to receive him, but they're rejecting him. And so the disciples have a bright idea. They see this happening and they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? In other words, Lord, if you want us to wipe them out, if you want us to kill them, we would do that for you. We'll take care of it. Sometimes I feel this way in traffic. But, again, pray for me. Uh, but Jesus says this. He turned and he rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to what? To save them. You see, God's agenda is all about redemption. There's going to come a time when, when sin and evil are held accountable and it's going to be no more. We're going to live in a reality where righteousness dwells forever. But until then, God's agenda is redemption, is transforming, is saving and he's inviting you and me to be his disciples, to be Christ-like, to follow him, and to make his ways known. But Jesus here, he, he rebukes them, and he rebukes what spirit they have behind what they're doing. And I just I want to offer us this, that, that Jesus does not want us merely to be moral in our convictions, 
but to be Christ-like in our actions. He doesn't want us merely to be moral in our convictions. We need to be. But he wants us to be Christ-like in our actions. What do we do with what we believe? This means if we believe in Jesus, if we are a disciple, we cannot follow our own paths lest we end up lost. We, we, we have to correct course. We have to allow Jesus to, to lead us. And in making us into fishers of men, we need to take steps in the direction of being loving and gracious to all, not just those who fit in our categories. That is hard, messy stuff. But it's what Jesus invites us into. When we follow Jesus, you see a, a miracle actually happens, and, and Paul talks about this in Galatians 2.20. I hope that this is our reality. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul gave it all up. For Jesus, and, and, and we know we don't have time to get into how he was corrected, course corrected by Jesus, and he ended up here. This is radical discipleship. It's impossible to be a disciple or a follower of someone and not end up like that person. Christian author C.S. Lewis once said this, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men unto Christ to make them little Christs. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals and clergymen and missions and sermons are simply a waste of time. We're called to be like Christ. And there's a difference between being a fan of Jesus and a follower of Jesus. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We find life. How many of you know this? That we find life in Jesus. And we lose meaning when we're so focused in on ourselves. The fan of Jesus has the bumper sticker, has the t-shirt, reposts that post on social media, but the follower of Jesus is bringing his or her life and attitudes, mind and heart into alignment with Jesus. Whoever will save his life will, will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, there are people who are fans of Jesus who don't act like him at all. People who say they're on a journey with Jesus, but they aren't learning from him, taking steps with him. They've been maybe attending church for years, but haven't grown at all. Maybe that person is the person you see in the mirror. But to be a disciple means that we allow Jesus to change us and correct us. And, and the hard question is this. Does the world know you're a Christian? Does the world know that you belong to Christ? Your spheres, your family, your friends, your co-workers, those that you spend time with, do they know you're a Christian because of your character? Do they know you belong to Christ? So we're called to be True disciples, we're called to, to be like Jesus. And this may sound like a daunting thing. You may be saying, Pastor Nate, you don't understand. I have, I have problems. I have challenges. I have addictions. I have habits. I've made a mess of my relationships. I've, I, 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 I'm down a course, and I don't know how to fix it. I've made a mess of things in my life. I remember long ago when I was being trained by Michael, the time came where I was to can the paint myself, and he was stacking the paint. And as I was, as I was canning, I was, I was just in the groove, and it, I was moving fast. The paint was flowing, folks. It was, it was happening. I'm sending the, the cans of paint down the conveyor belt, but then there was just a little tiny spill, and he needed to pause and take the rag and wipe it up get it proper for shipping, and I sent it down. But what I neglected to do was I neglected to stop the flow from the tank. And as I'm focused in on this little thing, all of a sudden, 
the tank, the tub overflows, and a good probably five, six gallons of paint were on the floor. And I shut everything down, and I look over my shoulder, and of course, who is there but my supervisors? And I turn as red as a tomato. It was a good contrast with the white paint on the floor. But I sheepishly look at Michael, and Michael, he looks at me, and he's just like, Nathan, it's okay. Let's clean it up together. And so he got down with me on his hands and knees, and we cleaned it all up, we scooped it all up, we disposed of it properly, and got me back on the right track, and we continued what we were doing. I want you to know that if you've made a mess in your journey, that Jesus is in the business of cleaning up our messes, of taking care of us, of getting us on the right track. If we have sinned, And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is in the business of getting us on the right track. He says to us, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is using an illustration of something that the hearers were so familiar with because they would see they would see oxen yoked together. And it was always an elder oxen yoked to a younger one, and the elder oxen would carry the load, would carry the burden, but would lead the younger ox in the direction that it needed to go. The older ox was responsible, well, kind of by force here, but the point is, was responsible for training in and leading the younger ox. And the younger ox had the lighter burden and was just cooperating with the older one. We're called to get in the yoke with Jesus. He says, abide in me. Abide in me. Ellen White once said this, abiding in Christ is choosing only the disposition of Christ. In other words, Christ-likeness and all that entails. So that his interests are identified with yours. Abide in him to be and to do only what he wills. These are the conditions of discipleship. And unless they are complied with, you can never find rest. That's the thing. It's not shame here. There's just the reality of not finding rest, not finding peace apart from discipleship with Jesus. You can never find rest. Rest is in Christ. It cannot be as something apart from him. And so the aim of discipleship, friends, we know is to be like Jesus. And finally, Jesus changes us to be disciple makers. When Jesus came into this world, he had an agenda. And as he discipled his disciples, he then closed out his ministry. Well, actually, this was in the, in the midst of his ministry. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Just as God the Father sent me, I am sending you as well to go and do the very thing that I did for you. Go and do for another person. Jesus sends us out to a lost and hurting world. He invites us to share what we have learned and experienced of Jesus with others. But notice that we're being sent. We're not just saying, hey, you in Bend or Lapine or Redmond, come over here, which is good, but we are sent to them. He sends us. There was a time I remember early in my faith where I swung on the pendulum, pendulum towards legalism, and I was so focused on preserving my own faith and making sure that I wasn't compromising good things, but I sequestered myself from others because I wanted to be on the right track. Fortunately, I I had a a really good uh, Christian friend who helped kind of coach me through that. And I realized that I, I, I can't simultaneously keep others at a distance and be a disciple maker. It's, it's kind of a no-brainer. 
God wants us to go into the world with the gospel. Of course, he closes his ministry by saying, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In other words, Jesus is saying, all that you've experienced with me, go and do the same for others. As I have discipled you, go and disciple others. Jesus begins with an invitation to discipleship, and he ends his ministry with the call to disciple-making. Go and do the very thing that you experienced with me. Some 20 years ago, 21, I became a Christian. I gave my heart to Jesus. I, I mentioned that earlier. I started reading. I started applying scripture. I was, I was coached. I was discipled by my pastors. But I was still working at that, at that paint factory. And um, Michael got a fire hydrant of information from me because I was so excited about what Jesus was doing in my life. I was so excited about what I was reading in the Bible. And so I was telling him everything that I was learning. And I'm looking back, and, and Michael was so gracious with me. He did have a Christian upbringing, um, and so he had some understanding, but uh, he was just letting me talk, letting me share. And when we are having an ongoing experience with Jesus, the natural outflow is to share that with others. In fact, I believe Ellen White once said, and I, I, I'm paraphrasing here, that the, the primary impulse of the renewed heart is to share Jesus with others. That's like the, the number one impulse. Well, time goes by, lots of time. I left the paint factory, went to to uh, Walla Walla, took theology. I, I went to seminary and um, had been growing in ministry. And uh, a few years ago, I get a message on Facebook. And I look, and it's Michael. And Michael says this. He says, hey, Nathan, I'm just letting you know that, that I've always been grateful to have you as a friend. And I've also recommitted my life to the Lord. I will be getting... I will be getting reborn in the very near future. Jeannie, this is his wife, Jeannie and I received a flyer in the mail for a prophecy seminar about two months ago. It was the night before it started, and it lasted two weeks. Jeannie asked me if I would like to go, and I said yes, not knowing which church we would be going to. Anyway, to make a long story short, it's called the Orchard's Seventh-day Adventist Church that we're attending, and we're getting to know the pastor. Everything we've been learning has made complete sense, and I wholeheartedly believe in Jesus and in what the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches. We've also made a few new friends. I share this with you. I mean, you can imagine my jaw hit the keyboard. I share this with you not to say that I had any big role in this, not to toot my horn or anything like that, but to say that God is still in the business of calling people to him, of transforming lives, of introducing people to truth, and somehow, some way, even in spite of us, he uses us. I think we just need to be open to however he is prompting us to, 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 to play a part in make, making disciples. Soon after that, I had the privilege of assisting in the baptism of Jeannie and Michael, and I'll never forget that. It was amazing. And I just want to say that, that God is so good, and he's still saving people. And so, I want to invite us to commit ourselves to Jesus again today, to be his disciples, to follow him first, and to allow him to transform us, to change us, to be more like Jesus. I want to ask you, what is that next step in your journey? Does that mean you need to read Scripture more? Does that mean carving out time intentionally to pray? Does that mean you got to make a phone call and reconcile with someone? Whatever that next step is, 
Let Jesus make you into a true disciple. I close now just by reminding us that a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he's fully trained will be like his teacher. And my prayer for you is that you would be covered in the dust of your rabbi. God bless you, my friends. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing a hymn together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we're so grateful to you for the privilege of being invited by you to follow you, to be changed by you, and to be sent as missionaries in this world. Or for each and every one of your disciples here today, I pray that you would take us to the next level in our journey with you. Thank you that sanctification is that work of a lifetime, and it's all about allowing you to change us. So we trust in you today. And Lord, we all need help in getting our hearts and minds on your agenda. So make us willing, Lord. Transform our lives. And may the lives that we now live in the flesh, may we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave his life for us. Help us, Lord, by your Spirit to be like Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.